Hey, it's Greg Harmon with Deceleration, deceleration deceleration.news. I'm an organizer, clean energy organizer with the Lone Star chapter of the Sierra Club. And I'm also a steering committee member for San Antonio's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan. Um, That is a mouthful, um, but essentially that that is, it means it's a vision for eliminating driving down and ultimately eliminating uh, our city's uh, global warming pollution, our climate pollution, while uh, at the same time preparing our city and our residents for the acceleration of extreme weather that that in this global shift uh, means for us uh, while um, you know, taking care of folks and, and building opportunities at the same time. So I wanted to make a podcast about the climate plan um, because since it was published, uh, a draft was released in January. It's gotten a lot of attention after about a year, you know, hammering this out, about 90 folks, uh, six committees um, that that has perpetuated kind of a, a narrative uh, that's just that's inaccurate. You know, so it's important to take the moment, take a breath, step back and and talk about, you know, what the plan is. Uh, what the plan is not, and, and why it all matters. Uh, so uh, in San Antonio, uh, this conversation really kicked up um, in 2017. Now, in 2015, there was a global agreement uh, that was struck in Paris, uh, shorthand Paris Accord, Paris Agreement, uh, was truly a global community. There was two countries on the planet that didn't sign on. Uh, one of those was Syria, which was in the middle of a you know, state collapse that was brought on partially by uh, extreme uh, climate experiences there. The, the destruction of crops and a massive heat wave in 2010 that also wiped out wheat in Russia, which was his biggest trading partner, uh, led to bread lines, bread to revolution. Um, so not a big surprise uh, that they weren't available at that moment. And um, and then in Central America, there was a, a nation down there that cast a, a, a protest vote, if you will, saying that this plan didn't go far enough. Um, the Paris Agreement uh, stands today uh, with the intention as a non-binding voluntary agreement to limit the amount of temperature rise that the world's governments um, seek to limit, right? So in that language, it's well below, quote unquote, well below two degrees uh, Celsius rise. We're over one. Uh, and so quick action is required. Um, that said, the most recent uh, document is pointing really towards 1.5 is where we need to hit the mark. So on June 1 of 2017, um, President Donald Trump went out into the Rose Garden and uh, gave his press conference and said, I'm beginning the process of pulling the United States out of the Paris Agreement. <laughs> Uh, it, it is actually a multi-year process, so we're just in transit. We're heading towards the exit, right, under this president. Um, but there was an extreme response, you know, around the country. And San Antonio was one of those uh, cities, among hundreds of others, uh, where people kind of rose up, or not kind of, but did uh, rise up and say, you know, we're still in. This city is still going to honor these principles, even if the federal government, you know, says it's not going to. And and this movement was global uh, in the U.S., where it matters the most uh, in terms of responding to uh, the White House, uh, we saw cities, we saw counties, we saw states, we saw indigenous sovereign nations, uh, we saw businesses and faith groups all kind of climbing in and saying, no, we're going to move it, you know, uh, uh, independently or together, you know, in the absence of federal leadership. Um, and so this is um, a few a few snapshots uh, from... Uh, I guess this is a week after uh, that announcement. Uh, We saw, you know, 100, 200 folks over those next few days come down uh, to Main Plaza. Uh, It's Texas Organizing Project. Here's Moms Clean Air Force. A lot of these are established organizations um, here in San Antonio. Uh, LULAC, Concilio Zapatista, um, made an appearance. Um, you can see some other signs back here, folks I recognize from other organizations. I think Puerto Unida um, was there. Uh, I saw their banner here, I think, in the corner. Uh, here's some Sierra Club uh, colleagues um, with some signs. Uh, and uh, Frankie at Society of Native Nations. Um, this is just, just a handful of folks who, who came out um, and really had an amazing success that that the election uh, we ended up uh ron nirenberg former council member became mayor 
and the first uh, the first meeting with this mayor and a new council, uh, we got this resolution, uh, and 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 that promises. Um, I can pull that up. Also, hold on, just yeah. So here's the resolution um, that we passed. You can see June twenty second, two thousand seventeen, and recognizing okay that there's this consensus in the scientific community that the the world is in crisis. We have these colliding ecological crises, um, and uh, that create economic burdens. Uh, and the military has termed global warming a threat multiplier. Um, on and on and on. So here's the you know the whereas is so what matters uh, here's the meat of it right. Um, the city commits to reducing greenhouse gas emissions um, in adopting and supporting the goals of the climate agreement. Uh, so San Antonio is bound. Uh, San Antonio is bound in this resolution right here. So but broadly right we're going to reach this. We're going to help reach this well below two degrees Celsius rise. Um, and to do that, the city needed a plan. We needed to look at it and say, what does that mean for San Antonio? You don't, you know, just say, hey, we're going to do this. And then what does it mean? Right. So the, a lot of research had to do, be done. A lot of work had to follow. And, and part of this here, the second part, um, I think what we're experiencing right now reflects um, aspects of this planning that, that didn't get done well, but it says the potential costs and benefits, um, right, of, of doing the work. CPS Energy, a uh, city-owned utility here in San Antonio uh, that has done well in the past, that has advanced advanced quickly years back, um, brought in uh, a lot of wind, right? Uh, Texas leading the nation in wind uh, and, and began to, to do some work in solar uh, has kind of gone dormant in terms of being a leader in renewable energy. But CPS stepped in and and pledged half a million dollars uh, to fund that research, the work that needed to be done in order to create a plan to fulfill this pledge, right? Uh, and so the climate action and adaptation plan is what came out of that. Um, this is uh, end of the year, December uh, 2017. You started to see these committees be put together, or at least the vision of this. The money goes out. UTSA is recruited as a partner in that planning and doing the research, uh, is subsequently replaced by Navigant Consulting. Uh, and some, like I said, 90 some volunteers came in on these various technical working groups, uh, the steering committee and the equity committee, uh, to, to look at best practices or the best way forward, uh, as well as examine the science and say, what does that mean for San Antonio to hit that number? Uh, and came out, so this report, draft report was published in January of this year. And the number that came out of it was 2050, right? Um, there was a lot of members and there are members continue to push for a more restrictive date, 2040 for net zero for zeroing out our greenhouse uh, pollution. Uh, but 2050 is the plan number. Uh, and it's important because that is really, mm, the one binding element, right, of the of the plan that was originally supposed to come up for vote in April. Um, and so the other part of that, I think, is significant uh, that isn't as well developed. And, and now it's been we're going to talk about this in, in a second, but it's been pushed back. Right. The vote's been pushed back to the fall. Um, and in in part of the opportunity there is going to be with the implementation element. Uh, there is language in the plan that talks about climate equity, uh, that there should be a, a, a committee, right, that, that begins to, to, to reviews, uh, discusses, debates, uh, recommends the, the response mechanisms to, 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 to reach zero by 2050. Uh, and part of that now, that conversation is, well, we've got to, we've got to, beef that up. We need to make that more significant. We make it more clear what we mean when we talk about implementation. Um, but to, to step back just quickly, so the January release, January 23rd, there was a meeting of the technical working groups and the, the steering committee. Uh, and we saw a kind of like the, the rollout um, uh, the next day and, and, and some of the council began to get access and, 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 and have some debate. Okay, here is Anita Ledbetter, uh, who uh, built San Antonio Green, and she served as the, the co-chair uh, of this process. It's not a small thing, as many of our, our uh, colleagues or friends have pointed out. It's not a small thing to um, 
you know, have uh, such an impact on so many people's lives, you know, and generations to come, the future of San Antonio. And this is the beginning. And, it, and, and the, the heavy lift is not over. You know, this is going to be playing out for years to come in terms of implementation and, and all the all the laundry list things. But, you know, again, we have to have a plan that fits everyone. Um, and that is um, um, very challenging and very exciting and a historic thing. For Suggestion is, is being made strongly in the scientific community that we have until 2030 to kind of have this like uh, steep, steep reduction in, in our greenhouse gases. And, and as we be, as we continue through kind of like this phase out, uh, and, and we're nowhere near that trajectory right now. Essay Tomorrow did some good, uh, research on this, uh, began, kind of began the process of looking at these issues. Um, and here is that. So this is the vulnerability plan that was provided uh, was, was uh, as part of SA Tomorrow, uh, the sustainability plan for the city a few years ago. And you can just see kind of an obvious point here is that it's getting warmer. You know, a lot of people that, that I talk to, my colleagues talk to in the community can just tell you just historical memory. You know, yeah, this is different. This is the, it's, the weather's more erratic uh, or it's just plain hotter at night. And here you can see that, that the winter temperatures are actually been rising faster than the summer, but it's all going up cumulatively. The warm and hot days, uh, the nights are noticeable. And, and the forecast, if business as usual is going to be our way forward, that this century is going to see summers in San Antonio uh, day after day after day. So there's like 90, 90 days flowing with life-threatening temperatures every day. Uh, that's uh, considered to be about 100 and through 103 degrees. Uh, if you have three of those days together, um, that's potentially lethal, especially if you can't cool your body core down at night. Um, that's lethal weather uh, right there. So that's what we're looking at ahead. And the thing that's interesting about this plan, so when we talk about heat, I'm just going to scroll through. So this is not the climate plan, but this is a kind of supporting earlier documentation what this plan got into is this right here uh the heat island impact and began to and and, and through the climate action planning process it began to merge this visual uh with with another which is the, the social vulnerability index uh, and i've got here um hat here there it is so this is bear county and this is the u.s centers for disease control and the atsdr uh, worked on this where they overlaid different demographic data. So this is um, socioeconomic status. This is, you know, extremely low income markers. You can see in the green uh, box there, we're looking at disability issues. We're looking at elderly populations and the very young. We're looking at um, uh, minority populations and those who are housing vulnerable or transportation vulnerable, meaning that they don't have a car or they're, they're, they're renting, uh, they're over, you know, they're underwater with their homes, whatever, whatever it is. So this is that, that social vulnerability, right? And you begin to overlay that with this concept, right? So what heat island means is that, uh, well, you can see right here, you may be up on the north side of town and it may be 88 degrees, uh, the same day, the same moment, the same time, same cloud cover, what have you, downtown, maybe 98 degrees. You may have a 10 degrees difference. And a lot of that has to do with tree canopy being removed, the way we uh, build, the way we develop, uh, clear cut, uh, and then do these just massive. So here, this is uh, side by side, the, the CDC social uh, vulnerability index with the heat island index. You can see areas that are obviously uh, that, that correlate, right? And particularly you can see west of San Antonio and south side of San Antonio, and then a little bit up there into the northeast. Uh, but these are very vulnerable areas. And these are, you know, represent populations that uh, you, you imagine going into. So when we begin to experience high temperatures uh, with storms, uh, with, with, with other of these kind of like impacts uh, day after day or week to week, uh, it's going to be really hard for people to uh, bounce back from that. So the plan comes out um, in January, and immediately, you know, you've got one of our council members, Brockhouse, he's putting out a press release saying, everybody's talking about this plan and how it's going to, 
you know, uh, outlaw gasoline powered vehicles, right? Because it prioritizes the future or recommends a future, uh, development of charging stations around the city, right? Uh, and expansion of transportation options. So we're banning, you know, banning gasoline powered cars. Uh, and you've got other folks talking about, oh, we're not going to be able to build houses, be too expensive to build houses. Oh, it's going to Valero Energy. So there's this whole whisper campaign that starts up around Valero Energy where you have representatives of the, the Chamber of Commerce, you know, uh, oh, you know, they're going to leave town if we pass this plan because, yeah, uh, Valero is kind of hanging back, but they've got lots of plenty of people carrying their water for them. And that includes the San Antonio Manufacturers Association, the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce. Not all the chambers, um, by far not all the, the the business community. The 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 frustrating thing is that these couple of folks that are out there doing this lobbying work, they're representing a very small number of businesses, and they're doing a disservice to a vast sectors of the economy in San Antonio. So, if you're out there, you're worried about you know your future longevity as a, as a company, in San Antonio, and you're not Valero Energy or New Star Energy, you may want to check in on this. I'm just gonna. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying because you're not getting represented uh, here. The rampant mischaracterizations uh, being made by uh, these few members of the business community, uh, this corner uh, of the of the business community, oil and gas interests, uh, really come without much by way of excuse. Uh, as do those comments being made by some of our council, uh, who keep suggesting this is that billion dollar albatross, you know, it's going to weigh down uh, our communities and our, our families. Uh, the message out of the Office of Sustainability has been pretty clear uh, throughout this process, even if the plan itself, red fresh, uh, can be complicated in, in some spots or, or, or not as clear as it could be. Let's listen to Doug Melnick. Anything that we implement in there is going to need this very conversation with those, all those stakeholders to figure out what those implications are because you know the idea of affordability is – really count on this. I mean, we start talking about um, making sure that strategies that are implemented don't have those negative consequences that we want to avoid. And so it's not simply about shifting the burden to one group, but how do we mitigate that or distribute that? So I think it's going to require really, you know, yes, we, this is where we need to go. These are the decisions we need to make. But the question is, how do you, how do, you do that? And, and what are the structures of that? So I think that's the that's the kind of, that's the process. Nothing's been baked into here. It's it's setting that target. It's setting here some pathways, but then we need to figure out what that pathway is. Nothing's been baked into here. So this is setting a target, 2050. Here's some potential potential pathways. We make those decisions going forward based upon our values. And the only real question that I see that, that our elected leaders and our community should be asking itself is, is this happening? Can we change it? And do we have a moral responsibility to act? And I, for myself, I've answered all those affirmatively. And I think most people, if they're honest, uh, would do the same, no matter what their background uh, or, or business may be. Uh, it's bigger than that. And so all I can say is, God bless Anna Sandoval. She is in the heart of this, trying to kind of lead this group along <clears throat> in this conversation. And uh, yeah, I saw the, the apology in the Rivard report that she wasn't felt like she wasn't doing the work. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who are not in in here. They need a little oreja action. Um, so uh, anyway, so let's pop that up. Correct. Right. Adopting the whole thing is, is an ordinance, but, but all, all the details we need to figure it out in their own individual stakeholder Correct. and development process. So, um, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All. I appreciate it. There's no ordinance inside of this plan, so what does it do? Uh, or the plan itself is is an ordinance. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you hear Anna and Doug here completing each other's sentences. All the details, they say, will be figured out in their own individual stakeholder processes. So this is something, obviously, you know, 2050 is, is the target by the by ordinance. And then the rest, you know, we work together as a community. Here it is. Here's the draft released in January. Uh, and we move in uh, to, let's see, page one. If you take away nothing else, here it is. There's a message from the mayor. 
here's the here is this is what the policy this is what the binding policy would be carbon neutral by 2050 all right all of this other mess that people are talking about uh, is these are these are fabrications these are assumptions um, built upon a, a quick read and a, and, a, and, a, and a marginal understanding of this document um, not to be insulting but but it is that simple okay so here's the the carbon neutral by 2050 and there is a, and there is an ongoing debate right is that number good is it solid is that what we should be looking for for San Antonio uh, when we see the, mo the most recent uh, major kind of document uh, the 1.5 degree uh, report from uh, uh, contributors to the the IPCC uh, process um, are holding that 45 to 55 is the window to reach zero but they're also uh, uh, pointing out that we need the rapid drive down earlier. It can't just be a straight line. And I'm going to drill into that real quickly before, uh, before I uh, break this uh, stream here. Uh, the document does get into equity. Uh, it's a point that, that seems to chafe at the, the, the chamber and the manufacturers association, at least the, the, the two representatives that are out there uh, claiming to speak for these, these, these large bodies of interest. Um, you know, suggesting, well, you know, I can't remember which one it was, suggesting that, you know, can't we just eliminate, you know, discussion of equity? Um, and we could, if it didn't matter to us, uh, that there are, um, that, that particular corners uh, and neighborhoods uh, within our city uh, quadrants are more vulnerable and more likely to suffer harm quicker and, and, and bounce back more slowly uh, than others. And so this whole, all this equity language is simply saying, where uh, where in our city are people likely to suffer the most as this process, as this acceleration of extreme uh, climatic violence uh, uh, continues and ramps up? And so that's a really important one. And it's one that I hope will be, uh, as this plan develops further for a fall vote, brought to bear, brought forward, brought out in conversation, because that's where the implementation uh, committee needs to be uh, the strongest and have the most authority in terms of approving um, policy. And so when we talk about the policies around this, that's what, what Doug was saying. And, and immediately I, I could have played forward in that clip. Uh, Assistant City Manager Rod Sanchez follows him saying, you know, yeah, you know, this is a conversation about that number. Future conversations, they're going to be difficult like this one is, but the future conversations are going to be how we build you know, build that body and build that body of work. So mitigation and adaptation. This is a mitigation adaptation plan. Mitigation means getting, driving down our contribution of that's the climate gases. So it's drawing that down, replacing it with clean energy. Uh, adaptation means what we do in San Antonio to prepare our neighborhoods and our families uh, for, for, for extreme weather, right? For, for violent climatic events. Uh, and so there's a lot of recommendations here. I mentioned there was like five different working groups and the steering committee, uh, and there's a raft of recommendations in here uh, on both those points. And that's where some of these folks are, are driving into this conversation and trying to uh, and kind of like take control of the conversation. Kind of they put all the dollar figures on investments, but they don't talk about the benefits. They don't talk about the cost of doing nothing in any real substantive way. Yeah. So here's adaptation measures, utility preparedness for, for climate. There's uh, Building benefits, retrofits, building retrofits, um, public health issues, um, uh, water fountains, health clinics. You know, and here. So here's the the letter that went out to committee members uh, when this vote got pushed back into the fall. And uh, down here, you'll see kind of like key points that uh, that are going to be addressed going forward uh, into the the fall. Uh, simpler language, readability, um, clarifying the intent of equity framework, which is uh, uh, possibly concerning whether they're going to be expanding and deepening and strengthening that or uh, weakening it to assuage particular interests, Valero. Uh, and then there's also this uh, um, this whole conversation about the business case, and I and 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 and, and, I, and I do totally believe that cost benefit that was in where is that? Our original resolution, okay, our original resolution in 2017 was exploring this, right? And and if it's been explored, it hasn't been spelled out very well. So this is an opportunity to do that. And here is, uh, again, here's the commitment going forward from the Office of Sustainability that this is what we intend to do. 
But there are also opportunities to strengthen this plan. It's not only about getting past what we have uh, and, and bringing a deepening awareness and understanding of what's on the paper right now, uh, making the ed edits and modifications based upon the feedback over this rollout, um, but there's a really significant and important change that still has to happen. So this is the chart. I kind of like breezed over it before, but this is the chart that's in the plan right now that shows, you know, our path to zero by 2050 is this long uh, linear, uh, is this long straight line, right? It's a 3% per year reduction to reach 2050. Um, and it's totally inadequate. This is not, this doesn't get us there. Uh, and um, you see, okay, so here's the 17.4 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year that, um, the inventory right now suggests we're putting out. I think it's considerably larger than that. But it's a, one note, San Antonio's coal plants, Bruce 1 and 2, on average over the last decade, they've put out 7.5 million metric tons. So a huge chunk of this is in the coal plant. If we're talking about the need, and we are, for a rapid reduction, starting there makes incredible uh, uh, sense, perfect sense. So this is then uh, one of the original graphs that the steering committee and some of the technical working groups were shown that this is where how we need to get to 50, 2050. And this is what's been published uh, most recently in the 1.5 degree report that 2030 is that critical moment where we need to be on the steep, steep slope going down. So we need to have made the decision, made the commitment to uh, transition our energy economy, a fossil fuel energy economy, into a clean one. And so that's what this graph shows. So when, when we show up to the mayor's office, uh, when we show up um, at, at council meetings uh, or, or what have you and, and, and advocating this 2025 uh, no coal message, 2030, uh, eliminating, you know, natural gas, uh, electricity, uh, 2040 net zero. This is the graph. These, this is the information that is informing and motivating people. The good news is that we have a mayor right now. We'll see if he makes it to the other side, uh, that understands that the city utility that we own, we get to also instruct, um, now, this has been uh, not a message. This has been a kind of a point of contention with our council, uh, with mayors of the past, uh, what we can, what the, where the authority is, right? Even though it's a city-owned utility, it's been set up under, you know, charter uh, to, to, to run its own day-to-day -day operations. Uh, but when it comes to generation decisions, when it comes to rates and, and these sorts of issues, that's something that where our council and our mayor can, can step in and, and correct you know, the utility and set a new course. Now, this is a, a press conference uh, earlier this year. Michael Bloomberg, the former mayor of New York City, uh, clean energy, um, Don, uh, right now, um, was where it was announcing that San Antonio was getting a big pot of money to do its work and cleaning up its in its building stock. Um, and so here is a, a question came out from the, the press gallery, um, you know, what about CPS? What about our coal plants? One additional uh, great tool uh, that we have as a public, and that is our energy utility. Both of them are owned by the public, so we have the ability to set policy directly based on the priorities of the climate plan. I think we're uh, out of time. So I hope that going forward, when you're in conversation, when you're in discussion about this plan, uh, the need for action, you'll think, you know, uh, back on some of these graphs. We know it's getting hotter. We know that the, and I didn't get into the whole global picture, but we're looking at, you know, or can we limit, you know, 1.5 degree, 2, two degree, uh, or are we going 6, 7, 8? And that's where it just you start seeing these feedback loops and just the collapse of, of the global climate and environment the way we've understood it and the way we've relied upon it uh, as, as a human family uh, for so long. Check in with Climate Action SA, climateactionsa.com. This is the community coalition organization. Uh, and be ready to engage on this. I think there's a, what's the saying? I think the saying is, don't let the bastards grind you down. Yeah, so uh, don't let, like that, right? Um, a habitable planet, a, um, a stable climate. Uh, these are non-negotiable. And we should be living and standing up as if we believe that.